Hello again. I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm continuing my discussions on the implications of abrupt climate system change in the past, present, and what we can expect in the future. So I'm presently talking about current and future sea level rise. Before we consider the possibility of a sudden collapse of the part of the Greenland ice sheet, let us consider a steady continuation of current trends. The sea level has risen about 25 centimeters, which is about uh, 10 inches, since 1900. A further rise of 30 to 40 centimeters would be devastating for a number of major cities as noted by Sir David King recently. Large areas of land and much of Bangladesh would be flooded, leading to mass migrations of people and hundreds of millions of climate refugees. However, as we will see, um, a further rise of 25 centimeters from ocean expansion is almost inevitable by 2050 simply due to the expected global warming as per the RCP 2.6, Representative Concentration Pathway 2.6, which is the most optimistic scenario from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. If we add in the contribution from unabated ice sheet melting, over 50 centimeters is quite likely by 2050, which is, would be devastating to many coastal communities. And meters by 2100 is possible. Now, my view is actually, I've done a number of videos in the past where I talked about, asked the question, could we get seven meters of sea level rise by 2070? And I highly recommend that you watch the original video that I posted of that title and a video subsequent to that about a year later and I would argue that it is quite possible. So interventions, climate restoration interventions to limit sea level rise are of huge significance and importance to the world. Sea level rise has two main components, the expansion of the oceans as the water warms and ice mass loss from ice sheets in the Arctic and Antarctica as they melt and discharge icebergs. There's also um, glacial, um, there's also uh, high elevation uh, mountainous regions that have glaciers that are, are melting back. It's another contribution. But the, the, the main ones are the expansion of the seawater due to increased temperature the, and the um, calving from Greenland and Antarctica. So let's consider the expansion. It's been estimated that one degree Celsius warming through the whole volume of the oceans would produce about two and a half meters of sea level rise. But the warming of the oceans from the surface downwards is slow. Only a fraction of the heat from greenhouse gas warming has gone into warming below the surface although more than expected. Net forcing from greenhouse, greenhouse gases and albedo loss is around 2.5 watts per square meter, whereas heat flux into the oceans is around 0 0.75 watts per square meter. Ocean expansion, like I said previously, was the main contributor in the 20th century with global surface temperature rising by 1.0 Celsius and ocean warming by 0.1 Celsius, producing about 20 centimeters of sea level rise over the century. The average surface temperature over the century would have been 0.5 degrees Celsius, including the, so that you're including the global surface temperature and the, the ocean uh, warming at the surface. The rate of sea level rise at the end of the last century would be twice what it was averaged over the cent century. So if the temperature rises to 1.5 Celsius by say 2050, and that's super conservative, it's probably gonna be much sooner, 
one would expect the sea level to rise a further 0.3 meters or so, 30 centimeters, simply from the ocean expansion alone. Now, of course, on top of that, we need to consider the contribution to the sea level from the ice sheets. There's a vicious cycle of warming and melting in the Arctic, due mainly to positive albedo feedback, which became apparent in the 1980s. The Arctic is now warming several times faster than the global average. This has caused an accelerated ice mass loss from the Greenland ice sheet with a possible doubling time. Now this is according to Hansen of 10 to 40 years. He, he modeled 10 to 40 years. And again, I've covered this in previous videos. Um, if you look at the last few decades, the doubling time has been closer to seven years because everything seems to be happening much faster than expected. So that 40 years became 20 years, 10 years, and seven years, the doubling time. Half a meter of sea level rise by 2050 is quite feasible. A continued exponential loss or a sudden loss from partial collapse of the ice could lead to the production of several meters of sea level rise by the end of the century. This is without considering the West Antarctic ice sheet. This is just from Greenland. There is a mechanical coupling between the two hemispheres. So meltwater from the Greenland ice sheet raises the, the global sea level. So the sea level around the West Antarctic ice sheet will be raised and vice versa. Okay, so what this does is it lifts the ice sheets up off of the bedrock and allows them to break up much more quickly. Glacier motion, even many kilometers from the ocean, is very sensitive to changes in the resistance at the termination points, such as produced by tides. So a small rise in sea level can amplify the effect of the highest tides, causing a general acceleration of ice loss along the length of the glacier. At present, the main annual contribution to mean global sea level is coming from the Greenland ice sheet, which helps to destabilize the West Antarctic ice sheet glaciers, such as Swaites Glacier, due to the above coupling. But the main cause of glacier destabilization is the warming and melting of ice from the air above and from the water below. Due to Arctic warming particularly, due to the Arctic warming particularly rapidly, and warmer Atlantic water entering the Arctic, the Greenland ice sheet melt is accelerating rapidly. Imagine what it will be like with a blue ocean, no ice all around it. For restoration of the previous norms, there need to be interventions for cooling the air above the Greenland ice sheet, refreezing the Greenland ice sheet surface, and or cooling the water at the glacier terminations. Unfortunately, the, the Greenland ice sheet and Western, West Antarctic ice sheet melt are accelerating and there is a danger of destabilization to the point of collapse, especially if the terminations become freer from obstructions such as sea ice, ice shells, or mounds of terminal moraine. For the Western Antarctic ice sheet, the pinning of the ends of glaciers has been considered but even if it were feasible, it would be hugely expensive. Therefore, alternative approaches are being examined. For GIS, Greenland Ice Sheet, the buttressing of the glacial termination in fjords can be considered. A barrier can be created from a melange of blocks of floating ice forming a dam to stop icebergs that have broken off the glacier from exiting the fjord. However, a sudden collapse of the barrier could trigger a sudden avalanche of ice blocks from the glacier. A safer way to slow the glacier would be to reduce surface melt and prevent meltwater from descending through moulins, which are big holes in the glacier, to the base of the glacier, which can lubricate its base and accelerate its loss. When air temperatures are well below freezing, ice could be created and thickened on any melt ponds so to the, one could increase the albedo, cool the air temperature further, and reduce meltwater flow through the moulins. But recent evidence from satellite gravity measurements suggests that much of the Greenland ice sheet mass loss is coming from southwest Greenland, 
which is an area largely devoid of glaciers. In order to slow and reverse mass loss from this part of Greenland ice sheet, interventions for cooling the surface and refreezing any melt ponds have to be applied. So a quotation from one of the papers was, the recent deglaciation of Greenland is a response to both oceanic and atmospheric forcings. From 2000 to 2010, ice loss was concentrated in the southeast and northwest portions um, of the ice sheet, in large part due to the increasing discharge of marine terminating outlet glaciers, emphasizing the importance of oceanic forcing. However, the largest sustained for about 10 years acceleration detected by gravity recovery and climate experiment, which is the GRACE, G-R-A-C-E, satellites, occurred in southwest Greenland, an area devoid largely of such glaciers. The sustained acceleration and the subsequent abrupt and even stronger deceleration were mostly driven by changes in air temperature and solar radiation. Continued atmospheric warming will lead to southwest Greenland becoming a major contributor to sea level rise. The fact of the ice sheets becoming riddled with moulins is perhaps the most serious sign that the point of collapse of these glaciers may be sooner than expected. We have been warned. Considering our latest understanding of the threat from sea level rise, these words from James Hansen are good reason for the development and deployment of interventions to halt sea level rise without delay. And here is the quote from Hansen. Despite these warnings about CO2 emissions, fossil fuels remain the world's primary energy source and global CO2 emissions continue at a high level perhaps with an expectation that humanity can adapt to climate change and find ways to minimize effects via advanced technologies. We suggest that this viewpoint fails to appreciate the nature of the threat posed by ice sheet instability and sea level rise. If the ocean continues to accumulate heat and increase melting of marine terminating ice shelves in Antarctica and Glacier and Greenland, a point will be reached at which it is impossible to avoid large-scale ice sheet disintegration with sea level rise of at least several meters. The economic and social cost of losing functionality of all coastal cities on our planet is practically incalculable. We suggest that a strategy relying on adaptation to the consequences will be unacceptable to most of humanity. So it is important for large numbers of people to accept this threat as soon as possible. Simply reducing CO2 emissions, even to zero, will not cool the Arctic. There is a growing realization that solar radiation management will have to be deployed, even using stratospheric aerosols as a short-term measure, despite widespread anxiety about this possibility. So, so basically, in this series of videos, I've been summarizing that some of the things that, you know, we, we can see in the AMEG group, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, you know, happening. Um, you know, the past, there's lots of information in the past about rates of change of greenhouse gases, of sea level rise, etc. You know, the, what people really did not expect is that the Arctic warming would have such severe effects on the jet streams and such positive, such, such amplifying feedbacks to destabilization of the entire climate system. So everything is being moved forward. So, you know, I've been arguing for many years that we're in an emergency climate situation, we need to declare a global climate emergency, and then we need to do three things. We need to slash fossil fuel emissions, we need to um, perform carbon dioxide removal to lower CO2 levels, and the new, the, the new target, the, the, the lofty target which we need to aim for is 300 parts per million by 2050. We also need to deploy solar radiation management techniques to allow us time to, to, to ensure that we don't lose Arctic sea ice and that things don't 
completely uh, get out of control and beyond the capability of us to do anything.